So what we look at now is the conservation laws involved in nuclear reactions. But before we do that, it's important to realise that when you get an individual proton, you fire it at a neutron as they collide, they can actually come together and form a new nucleus. So what we're getting here is a nucleus being formed by the individual proton, which has a certain mass, joined to a neutron with a certain mass. Now when they form as a nucleus, an interesting thing happens here. They've actually got slightly less mass as a total than what they started with. So if you add this mass together here, mass 1 and mass 2, and compared it to this mass here as a combined mass, you'll find that this one's actually got less. Okay? So this one's actually got less mass than what it started with. And this is called a mass defect in forming the nucleus. All right? Now it was Einstein that thought of this idea that mass was another form of energy. Okay? And he proposed the idea that the mass that's lost here, this mass defect, delta m, the mass lost, would actually be converted to energy by his famous formula, E equals mc squared. All right? And that would give you the energy lost or formed in joules. So in forming this nucleus here, you'll find some mass is lost, and the reason for that is it's converted to energy. So the energy can appear in lots of forms. This might actually appear as kinetic energy, or come off as a gamma ray photon, which is a type of light, and so on. Okay? So that's the formula of actually predictor. Now I've got some notes on that here. So Einstein's proposed this idea that mass is another form of energy. He actually did mathematical uh, calculations here and showed E equals mc squared as a formula to calculate that conversion. And the mass is definitely less when it's formed from its separate parts compared to its separate parts or constituent parts. Okay? So if you look at some numbers here on that, there's your mass of a proton, there's your mass of a neutron. When you add them together, you get this much mass. But afterwards, when you go and actually check the mass of a deuterium particle here, it's actually less. So that mass loss here, it looks like a very small amount here, okay? That's converted into energy because mass is simply another form of energy, okay? So you can use your equals mc squared to work that out, all right? Now that means that if you wanted to break the nucleus apart, you would need to put the mass back in somehow. So what you would normally have to do then is shoot energy at that in some form, like photons, and actually blast that apart and the mass will be rec recovered and actually separated. So the energy required, or the minimum energy required, to sort of break up a nucleus into its separate bits is called the binding energy. Okay? The minimum energy needed to break up a nucleus into its separate parts or its constituent parts is called the binding energy. And you can see we've got some calculations here. It's actually 2.25 mega electron volts for this particular example. 2.25 million electron volts just to put one part of the nucleus and bring it apart again. So you're talking large energies because you're working against a nuclear force there, which is really big. Okay. Now, in actual fact, this is about a million times bigger than what you would get from a chemical reaction because the chemical reaction only involves the forces between a proton positive and a negative charged particle and electron. So those uh, forces tend to be smaller. The energy is released from chemical reactions involving electron shells and electrons sort of joining and recombining, whatever else. Uh, is a lot less than the, nu the nuclear one because of the force being so much bigger. Now, our next step in the process was that they could actually do nuclear reactions back in the 40s and 50s, which went to that first atomic bomb. So nuclear reactions have some conservation laws that must be obeyed that they discovered through their research. So the first one would be, so if you put two nuclei together and actually did get them to fuse together, what would be conserved? So you could actually fire a proton in a particle accelerator, there's a proton there, at lithium as a target. Now, it would need to be shot at high energies for the proton, the hydrogen there, to be shot at fast enough speed to get past the electrostatic repulsion that's going on here. Because obviously these are going to repel the positive charge. So normally it would actually get so far, slow down, stop, and turn around. So you need to get it going fast enough to actually get in close enough for the nuclear force to take effect and then hold it. Okay? And now, obviously, it actually sort of hits that, so it does actually sort of break the nucleus apart and become part of what's left over there. So in this particular case, what it does is it actually forms another particle here, HE42. Okay, now it turns out the other one that it releases here is another alpha particle. So it actually splits the nucleus up into two halves there, roughly, okay, equally in this case, and you're going to get HE42 and HE42. So what's conserved in this reaction then when you look at it? What's always conserved? First thing that's conserved is the number is the charge. The total charge has to stay the same before and after the reaction. So if you check this out here, you've got a charge of plus three, plus one, that's four. Here you've got two and two. Yes, it's, it's conserved. Four is equal to four. 
before and after the reaction. Okay? Charge is conserved. The other thing that's conserved here, if you check the top numbers here, is the total mass number. So, total number of nucleons is conserved as well. So, if you look at that, we've got 7 plus 1 is equal to 8, and afterwards we've got 4 plus 4 that equals 8. So, the total number of nucleons, the total number of protons plus neutrons, has to be the same before and after the collision. All right? Now, other things are conserved here. What about mass? Does that stay the same? Is energy the same before and after when you check it? So it turns out that mass is not conserved in the collision because we've already talked about the fact that the mass is lost. And in this particular case here, you will find that this mass here is slightly lower than beforehand total. Okay? This actually drops in mass slightly going from one to the other, small fraction. Okay? So the mass is not conserved. The energy before and after is not conserved either. But if you combine these two ideas, the total mass energy is conserved. If you consider mass to be another form of energy as a total, total mass energy is conserved. All right? Because if you work out what the mass loss is and you convert it to energy, as a total, as a combined total, both of those things together will be conserved. Same before the collision and after. Now, the last thing that's conserved is momentum. As in all collisions and all interactions, the momentum before the collision or before the reaction has to be the same as uh, after the reaction. Now, I've got this down in my notes for you on here. If you look at this, key things are conservation of charge, so the atomic numbers should add up together to be the same. The conservation of the number of nucleons, the mass number should end up being the same before and after as a total. You should conserve the total mass energy there, and so therefore any mass that goes missing will become energy, so that the total remains the same. And we're using that E equals MC squared formula to work that out. So if we look at that example I've just shown you here, if you check this out properly, these are the rest masses of hydrogen and lithium. And you can see we've gone down to lots of decimal places here because we're talking about very small debt mass differences. We need to keep the right number of significant figures there. So try and keep as many as you can when you do this. If you add them together, there's the mass beforehand in kilograms. Afterwards, the mass of those two helium particles coming off is going to be this amount of mass. And you can see there's actually here, there's a decrease in mass there. Okay? And that decrease in mass, if you subtract the two, you can get as a mass defect here in this case. That's been converted to energy, and again, it's in large amounts. Now, that would actually appear as kinetic energy of the products. These are going for high energies, high speeds. Okay? And they'd obviously go in a particular direction and add together. So the momentum of these afterwards match the momentum of these beforehand. It has to be conserved because that's the fourth law there. So that sort of shows you the four conservation laws in brief there. Now, one last thing they might be asked uh, in exam situations would be, what happens if a nucleus does actually decay and what would it do in terms of the direction and momentum? So when uranium decays, for example, why does the helium particle and the thorium particle go in opposite directions, if this is hardly moving? And why does this go so much faster than the thorium? So you need to use conservation momentum to sort of explain that. So let's look at these in two ways. So if we try to explain why the helium and the thorium would move off in opposite directions, with much faster speed and energy to the helium nucleus, you need to use conservation momentum. Let's assume that the uranium nucleus was hardly moving at the start then, it's virtually at rest, stationary. Now that means the total momentum beforehand is zero. P total beforehand, zero. Now that means to conserve momentum, you should have a total momentum afterwards of zero as well. Now the only way that can happen is if the products, right, have a momentum of zero, they must have an equal momentum, the two products, that go in opposite directions so that they cancel. Okay? So equal momentum, opposite directions, they'll cancel to zero and conserve momentum. So that explains why they go in opposite directions. Why is helium faster though? Well, helium's got a mass that's much smaller. Now don't forget momentum is mass times velocity here. Mass times velocity. So if you have something with a much, much smaller mass then, you're going to have a much, much larger velocity. Now, if you compare the two masses here, this one's 4 and this one's 234, it's about 58 and a half times smaller, this one is. So if it's that much smaller, it must have that much, it must have that much faster speed, all right, to give you the same momentum as the thorium particle that's produced. So it moves much faster because it's a much smaller mass. So they're the points you could make to explain why this is going to spit out the alpha particle, the helium nucleus, is going to come out at high speed 
with a small recoil for the thorium nucleus. Okay? It also takes most of the kinetic energy because of that high speed, by the way. Now, you could show this mathematically if you want to show the correct number, and you would start with the momentum before total has to be the same as momentum after total. Now, don't forget that's zero to start with. Therefore, we've got two objects here now. One's the thorium, okay? And the other is the alpha particle, the HE one. So that's what you start off with. Then you'll try substituting stuff in here. Now, the mass of the thorium is pretty good as an indicator for the mass number. So 234 times the velocity of the thorium plus mass of the alpha particle. That's a good indication, the 4, the H. So if we wanted to work out the speed of the VH here, we could actually bring it on this side and make it minus 4 VH. And you can see straight away here, it has to be going in the opposite direction to the thorium because you have a negative sign there now. So it's opposite. The size then would be, let's go and divide these through, you've got minus VH, divide through by 4, 234 over 4 times by VT. So you can see it's about 58 and a half times faster than the thorium. So that's a way of showing it mathematically. You could also do the same thing with kinetic energy, by the way. To do that, you can compare the kinetic energy of the helium to the kinetic energy of the thorium. So if you want to look at the ratio of the kinetic energy of the helium particle to the thorium one, you can just do it like that and put in your half mb squared and start from there. Now, you could actually cancel some of this stuff out. The halves would be the same. Now the mass of the helium here would be the four that you would be using. And the thorium one has got 234. Now we've already worked out the ratio of VH to VT just here. is actually that number there. So you could go and put in 234 squared over 4 squared. And when you look at that, I would not be cancelling the squares out. You can't cancel these two squares out here because that's not mathematically correct. What you can do is you can cancel out that one with that one. And you cancel out this one with this one. And again, you get the same ratio. It's got 58.5 times the kinetic energy. All right, so it's got 58.5 times the speed and also 58.5 times the kinetic energy. Okay, so it comes off with high energy. Okay, thank you.